The following content has been provided by RWTH Aachen University. All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to uh, Designing Interactive Systems 2 today. Um, so this class sort of connects to Designing Interactive Systems 1. Quick check, um, who of you guys took DIS 1 last semester or before? Everybody, wonderful. Um, this will continue what we've been doing there, but it will go back way more towards the technical side of things. So it will feel more, thanks Sebastian, uh, it will feel more um, sort of, uh, you know, well known to you as computer scientists. Um, if you only remember one thing from our class today, it's the jump page, hdi, etc., slash dis2. This is where you should go to find everything that you need for this class. So there is a syllabus on there, a wonderful schedule in a newly designed website that you can look at. And uh, from there, you find jump pages to videos, slides, um, assignments, and those kinds of things, L2P links or Avatar Online Moodle links. All right, so the syllabus for this class is going to be um, in part one. We will talk about some key concepts, which will start with the very sort of starting point of interaction, which is the user doing something at a technical system, whether it's a smartphone or laptop or uh, whatever it might be. Uh, so we'll talk about device technologies and try to classify those and get an understanding of how different devices can um, offer different kinds of um, input capabilities. And then we will move to uh, a um, reference model for Windows systems. Windows systems is to be taken very broadly. Any system that needs to you know, display graphics somewhere, process events and react to them, distribute them to applications, get the feedback what apps want to do. Um, so it could be on a mobile device, it could be on a, um, on a desktop device. This uh, architecture model is a reference model that is abstract, but it is very closely modeled on existing uh, systems. Once we're done with, this, with those basics, by the way, um, there you will be um, also building your very own window system, um, starting with a graphics library that we give you, an event processing library that we give you on the very basic level, and then you will build the other levels on top yourself. Um, this in the, part, in the past has been one of the most um, well-received assignments, actually, by students. Say they said that's very helpful to actually you know, get to grips to how do I actually process events? How does that actually work? How do I write an event loop? Um, handlers and, and uh, draw on, you know, in different windows and those kinds of things. Um, then we'll move through uh, a whole bunch of window systems. The idea here is not to make you, you know, expert developers in, in all those different, you know, windows and, and X and OS X and, and whatnot uh, systems, but to look at them to understand which design decisions these people took and those design decisions and those trade-offs are the things that you really can take away from this. Right? I mean, you're at RUH Aachen, so I don't expect you to end up to be some lowly programmer somewhere. You'll probably be making, as a system architect, design decisions on those things at some point. So at some point, somebody might walk up to you and say, like it actually is just happening to a friend of mine um, who uh, did his PhD here um, quite a few years ago. He's now been tasked, you know, there's a company that makes medical devices. They want to now do everything on touch screens, et cetera, and he needs to build and architect, basically, the event handling and, and, and whole graphical user interface toolkit that goes with that. So rather than just becoming people who can use window toolkits or user interface toolkits of very, uh, various kinds and write apps with them, uh, we hope that we will enable you to actually be the architects of future toolkits. Um, so this will cover lots of things. Good morning. Um, we will talk about X window, the X window system. Uh, we will talk about small talk. Uh, we'll go into you know, Mac OS and, and uh, Windows. We'll talk about cross-platform toolkits that try to address different underlying hardware uh, uh, lab labels. Uh, we will see different layout engine concepts, paradigms, problems with each of those. We will move then beyond uh, the uh, sort of desktop user interface and get into, um, of course, uh, mobile devices. So we'll touch on iOS and Android um, and how those work from a UI toolkit and, and uh, Windows system point of view. 
um, we will address how we work with multimedia. So how you, for example, build systems that are specifically designed to work with audio, video, those kinds of things. And we'll take a brief look at uh, interactions beyond just, you know, typing on a keyboard, moving a mouse, or, or touching a touchscreen. Um, so we'll look at other forms of interaction, such as, you know, voice input, output, um, and those kinds of things. The last part then, part four, is on prototyping. So here, uh, this is also something that we've uh, extended over the years because we find this really important and this there's been a lot of advancements um, in toolkits out there and design tools. Uh, will help you understand how once you've done your you know, paper prototype, video prototype, whatever, um, you know, your mock-up in DIS1 in that cycle, and you want to get more serious towards software prototypes, um, what are the tools that are available to you? you know, once you're done with that, you've, you've made your you know, PowerPoint uh, clicky, uh, clickable prototype, what are you going to do next? You, know, you don't need to jump into development right away. In fact, that would probably not be advisable, but you want to use one of those UI design toolkits that help you to really quickly prototype your interface, but not having to throw away all of that once you move to implementation. Right? This used to be the case that you built your system in a prototyping environment, um, people used to use things like Director of Flash or stuff like this or maybe make it up as a website or as a, a very elaborate PowerPoint. And then they would throw all that away and just take the design decisions from that and give that to the engineering team who would then rebuild everything from scratch in their toolkit, let's say, uh, with the Windows APIs. Nowadays, you don't need to do that. The tools have gotten smart enough so that your designs that you make can actually digitally transform into something that you can use in your, in your IDE to build your software. And here always, uh, also we will touch on prototyping also beyond the desktop. Uh, we'll even get into some physical computing, meaning that we'll uh, talk about things like Arduino and sensors and actuators, how you build systems that don't even need to run on a comp computer anymore, but that are really more about embedded systems. Right? A lot of the interfaces that we see today are embedded devices, very small devices that, um, you know, even this thing here has a UI, right, and that needs to be designed somehow. So how do you prototype those? and we'll give you the tools and, and knowledge to make that happen too. Very quickly, some administration uh, points. This is a, a, a typical lecture uh, slash lab format on paper. In reality, it'll feel a little different. Um, like you know from DIS1, we're moving our classes. We've moved our classes to a studio format as far as we can so that we, have, we give you the chance to look at videos at your own pace, at your own time. Um, so you can watch them quickly or, you know, speed me up by 50% if you think it's really, you know, easy to get or you can slow me down or watch it twice, whatever. Um, and then we can use the time in class to actually interact and, and have a discussion. Um, this worked really great for DIS1 um, with all the design assignments that we have there. It'll be a little trickier here for DIS2 since we have a lot of technical material that we need to get through. And also DIS2 is more being sort of renewed every year simply because the um, technologies, of course, are moving on. So we'll always have some elements in here where we also have to do um, live lectures, if you like, because the material is just brand new. Um, class times are um, up here, lecture Wednesdays, 8.30 to 11, right here today. Uh, lab is on Mondays. Um, and uh, as I said, the lecture will often turn into a studio when we uh, can make that work with the, with the content. Um, who's doing this? So, uh, besides myself, um, there's uh, Sebastian over here, who's your friendly TA number one in this class, your teaching assistant. And then there's Anke, who's uh, on vacation this week. She'll be back next week. Um, and these two are taking care of you. Um, as usual, if you want a, uh, if you're hoping to get a reply uh, to your emails, it's a really good idea to email these guys about the class, okay? Um, if you send it to me, I will probably need to pass it on to them anyways because they know much more about the in-depths of RWH online and where the file for the assignment is and so on. So please contact them first. If you can't resolve something with them, uh, sure, they can escalate it up to me or you can talk to me directly, um, but they should be your first point of contact. Your final grade. Um, this is a class where you will be doing a lot of coding and uh, weekly assignments because this part where we talk about toolkits, you know, the, the large part two and, and, and three into a part also four, so everything after the reference model, uh, will involve 
basically getting exposed to a whole variety of different uh, UI, UI toolkits. So that you can you know, get your feet wet and, and work with these toolkits and get an understanding for how it feels to build code with them. So that you get to appreciate what trade-offs these designers, the architects of these toolkits have made and how that impacts the developer experience. Um, so your final grade is uh, based on uh, the 40% uh, for your weekly assignments, uh, which we'll be uh, giving out. Um, and then there's going to be a midterm as usual, that's 25% of your grade. And there's the final exam uh, for 35% of your grade. Apart from those percentages, also please mark your calendars now that uh, there will be no uh, late you know, snowy, uh, skiing vacations or, or going to uh, Mallorca on those days uh, because you'll have to be here for the exams. Um, this is the, the as, as you were putting it so nicely, this is to scare them, right? This is just saying, uh, because we are giving a fair, you know, fairly intense amount of feedback, as you've probably seen in DIS1, uh, we'll need your guys to submit stuff on time. So don't submit late, otherwise don't, you need to, don't need to submit at all. Um, you need to work with a team size of two people. If we explicitly allow you to, you can be with three people, but usually that shouldn't be necessary. Um, if you hand in by yourself because you know, you're the renegade who can do it all by self, yourself, that's great because we don't need to review it as, um, either. Um, that's going to be a 5.0. Um, if your code doesn't compile and how it needs to compile under what circumstances uh, will be in your assignments, again, a 5.0, we don't really want to be the debuggers of your code. Uh, but you've seen that from programming classes before in this, in this program. Uh, for some assignments, you will need a Mac. If you don't have one, that's totally fine. Uh, we have a pool of, of Macs downstairs in the um, computing, science, uh, computing Services Center um, that you can use. And we've worked with them to prepare them so that they will be able to uh, let you log in there for you know, doing iOS development, for example, which you can really only do on a Mac or to do Mac OS X development. Um, you'll be submitting stuff via Moodle, so we're riding the, the, the hot wave of um, trying out the, the new uh, system here, so bear with us if things aren't going so smoothly, we'll all have to uh, just work together to make that a success. Um, as I was saying, the jump page has every information that you need. Um, it's been cleaned up a bit from past years, so you should be able to find all the important links and, inf and information right here. So please remember that jump page slash DIS2 um, for our class. You may remember this one from last semester when we talked about this in DIS1. Um, we had a coverage of uh, DIS1 of sort of this left-handish side and this lower area here, right? So we talked about human information processing. You learned how people interact with technology in a very sort of psychological basic way. Um, and uh, we talked a lot about um, designing a pro and um, evaluating things. So prototyping, you know, the DIA cycle is basically what's going on designing and then evaluating and designing and evaluating. Uh, and we looked at a lot of you know, example systems. The whole history look, uh, look back in HCI was part, you know, basically this. So in DIS2, we're going to cover more on this side. Right? We're going to talk about um, input-output devices. As I was saying, these dialog architecture zones and techniques is basically the whole technical part of how do you build these systems. And then we're going to look at concrete sample examples of implementations um, that, uh, that work that way and how the design tools work that you use. Uh, you can see we're skipping a few things here. Classical ergonomics is not going to be part of this lecture uh, in the sense of you know, human reaches and stuff like this. Um, and computer graphics, of course, um, please go see my excellent colleague Life Cobbled if you want to learn about computer graphics. We're just going to dabble in that and give you some very, very basic things that you need to understand how the um, graphics libraries and event processing libraries work. Um, we're also not touching on uh, this up here. Of course, the context of use is super important. You learned that in DIS1. Uh, but looking at how whole organizations react to introducing some technology, that's really a topic of computer-supported collaborative work. Again, we've got people in, uh, in I5 um, that teach that stuff quite well. DIA cycle, I don't think I need to go into much detail here, because you all learned this last semester. 
um, brainstorming, sketching, UI re interviews, um, refining, paper prototype, etc. You remember all this. Um, the name DIA cycle may not be something you hit on in uh, you know the uh, the literature. Just don't be surprised if people call it I don't know the iterative design model or the task artifact cycle or you know the agile development for of user interfaces. These are all the same basic ideas. Uh, the one thing we're, we're trying to move beyond, of course, is the waterfall model. Great. So let's jump right in and uh, do a quick recap. Uh, this is another history tour. You might say, oh, no, we've done history in DIS1. Not again. Uh, but this is a very different view on how the, uh, the history of, of HCI and interaction techniques developed. Um, we will look at them from a technical point of view to understand how interaction with the user worked technically in each of these system generations. Um, the very early systems, you know, you've probably never seen these, but these were punch cards. I've also never really used them. I've, you know, they were handed out as, you know, basically scribble cards for us as students because nobody used them anymore. So, um, but when you had systems like that where you'd put, like, you know, code your uh, program and your data on these punch cards, you would carry it to the operator, give to him the stack of punch cards, not dropping them in the process, because that's you know, terrible. And then you know, they would put it in the machine. Next day, you would, come, you, know, you would come back, and you would get a printout of the results of the code that you'd been running. Right? So that was the 50s, if you like, you know, kind of interaction. Um, there is no interaction with the computer while it's running. Right? You are not able to influence what it's doing, um, you know, press buttons and make it do certain things. You're just giving it one program to run, one course of action, and then it comes back with the results. And if you have made a mistake or if you wanted some different variables for your code, you had to type them in and do it again the next day. Um, so what that means is, this is interesting from a technical point of view, because if you think about what, is the, in, what does the code contain as user interaction, basically nothing, right? Um, if there was anything where the system wanted to create some output, it would you know, do the output on a printer. And, and that was basically the same, sending you know, data to the printer or sending it to a file, same thing. And uh, this actually continued as a mental model long, for a long time into the you know, terminal um, era of, of things and the Unix uh, world, where you still had a model of basically user input and output coming from a keyboard and essentially being just a stream of characters that I could basically also replace with a file that you read those characters from. With some simple job control languages, you could specify parameters for your job. So you would basically start um, coding a little bit of, of an interface, if you like. Um, but this was really a, um, if you want, this was an interaction that was only happening at one point in time when you handed over your punch cards and another point in time uh, when you got back the results. So there's only like momentary interaction. That's why um, um, Nielsen in, a, in his book on, um, uh, on, on UI uh, prototyping calls it a zero dimensional user interface because the interaction is only in points in time, right? One point at the beginning, one point at the end. Um, here's a model of how that would work. You've got your batch, you've got your, you know, your program basically, um, then this program is being read in, it's executed, you have no influence, there is no user interaction, and over, over time the program you know, spits out stuff on a printer and writes line after line on, on its output report, and in the end you get that report. Right? So that's, the, uh, that's how this would work. From you know, a point of view of, of how the code looks, this is fairly simple code to write. Right? You don't have to think about user interaction. Um, nobody's going to be pressing any buttons while your, while your app is running. Um, you just do what you're supposed to do. Right? This then sort of evolved into time-sharing systems, which meant that you had um, a simple terminal. These things were very dumb. Right? They could really only display characters on the screen and, and that they receive over a serial line and send input back over a serial line that you typed onto um, this uh, on the keyboard. Um, and the big computer was sitting in the basement and was you know, connected to many of these terminals. That's why it's called time sharing systems because you, you would share time 
of the computer running. Back in those days, that was actually the scarce resource, right? You know, running a computer was really expensive, so you'd have to buy time to run on it. You can still see that kind of model when you look at today's high performance systems here that our high performance computing folks here in the, at Avatia have. If you have computers that you know, today cost billions of dollars, then you still um, actually need to book time uh, and processing time on these machines. And that was the case with you know, any computer that you wanted to talk to back then. Um, so you do get shorter turnaround times, right? Here you would type in, I don't know, a, a command like, I don't know, ls or dir, right? To, to look at the contents of the current directory. And then that command would be typed in here. You hit send basically on that keyboard and you would send then that command down the serial line. The computer would process it, right? Your command goes in here, computer processes it and output stuff. Now this stuff is no longer a printed report, it's on the screen, but still while the program is running, although it might be short, maybe just you know, a second or so, or a fraction of a second, you have no influence over the program. The program starts and ends uh, before you can interact again. Right? So from a program point of view, the structure of the code is still the same. I don't need to worry about user input happening while I'm running. I'm getting all the user input that I need basically at the start of uh, the execution. Um, this is basically with applications that can read arguments from the command line. Has anybody ever written a uh, program in C? Yeah, okay, quite a few of you guys. How do you pass commands, uh, arguments into like a typical, have, have you written command line programs in C? No, anybody written programs that just have a textual interface? No GUI? Yeah, how would you pass code and in, in, like arguments into that? Yeah, exactly. So you, you often see like, you know, arg C and arg V as sort of the, the two arguments of, of a command line um, program in C. And those two, one is basically just a, a vector and the other one is a counter of, of how many commands you're getting. And then the first one will be the name of the command, the second one will be the first parameter that you put in. So if I type in dir and then a name of a directory um, that I want to look at, then that would be a first argument. That's a couple of characters that get put into a variable for me by the system. And then in the code, I can look at the arguments that the user passed into the, into the program by looking at these variables in the array. But that's just me looking at variables that were filled at the beginning, right? This is the, uh, what's going on here. And you still see that in Unix commands. So if you Anybody been running a, a Linux computer? Opened a terminal on the Linux computer? Yeah, you're doing this all the time, right? When you type in ls enter, you are still working in that mode, right? ls is a program that doesn't need to worry about interaction while it's running. It just does the thing that it's supposed to do as fast as possible, and then it quits and you're back um, in interaction. So still interaction only in points in time, just you know, the, diff the distance between the points is getting significantly shorter. Now we have um, a weird mix that started to happen with full screen textual user interfaces. Um, could anybody remember a, uh, a program that is a full screen textual user interface that you might have been using? Yeah? Vim, Vim exactly. Vim is VIM, the, the text editor is actually sort of the, the grandson of the old venerable VI. Uh, this is Vim running in a, in, a, in a terminal window. Emacs is another example. So these text editors are great examples. Or sometimes you see, you know, on old DOS systems, you would see um, menu systems where you could, you know, press, you know, arrow keys or, or, or letters to select things from a menu. Uh, this would be examples that use the full screen. So the only thing that changed there that the, uh, you know, the code was able to, um, you know, or the interface was able to go back to early lines, so you are no longer just outputting line by line. But there's a significant difference here in how you would write that code. Um, here, you would have, uh, if this is your code, you would basically be looking for input. Let's say this program, you know, VI for example, uh, you have to hit a certain key to start entering text, right? So it's waiting for you to hit a key, and if that key that you hit is, for example, start entering text, then it would, um, switch into that mode, and then it would come back here, and it would wait for, the, wait for the next character. You hit the next character, which is an, I don't know, uh, a D, then it would put a D on the screen in this code, and would come back. And then you say I, and it does again, S, and you've typed DIS. And then 
you maybe hit the, uh, the colon key or the escape key, and the escape key is a special thing that puts VI into command mode, so it would do that here, and then it would wait for like a W and a Q and process those in turn, and that's a write and quit command. So every single character, it's basically 99% of the time this is code that is waiting for user input. That's very different from what we had before, right? So this is waiting for user input all the time, and when you press a key, it does what it's supposed to do, and then comes back as quickly as possible. So you have a turnaround now that you could say is based on a per character interaction. At every character you can actually do something and influence what the code is doing. So this is where the interaction starts to feel real time-ish, right? You're typing and if the computer is fast enough, it's keeping up and you're, you're inputting text. So in reality, if this is running, you would normally not notice any delays by you know, the code just putting, uh, you know, this part of the code just putting it character on the screen, not a big deal, it's so fast that it feels to you that it's basically always listening to you. But it isn't. It isn't because while it's doing this, it can't process the next input you do. So if this could take any longer, if this takes a long you know, time, you will be sitting there with no way to stop, interrupt, or interact with the code. That's important, right? It's listening, and then it you know, turns off its listening, it does its thing, and then it comes back and listens again. Um, could anybody imagine at what point this could break down? Like, do you have an example of when this could start feeling not so real time? Let's take maybe the text editor as an example. What kind of actions could the software have to do where all of a sudden you're like, hmm, it's not reacting to my key input anymore. Yeah. Maybe during um, um, yeah, pagings or if, if the software has to communicate with other, other parts of, of, of the bigger software. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, paging is a good example. So if it, you know, let's say the system ran out of, out of, uh, of memory and then it would have to you know, do stuff in this, in this particular loop here and come back before it can come back to listen to code again. Um, or when you're saying communicating to other parts of the, the, the system, basically. A great example, um, did you have one? Uh, I.O. operations. Yes, exactly. Printing stuff. Right. Saving stuff. Saving, loading, all of those, right? Um, so those are examples where, let's say you, the button you press here is this W button while you're in command mode, then it means save the file to disk. Now, usually that's like, you know, instant, right? You don't notice it, it's just a text file. But let's say you've mounted, you know, a disk, that is a network drive or somewhere in the cloud and you're on a 3G connection, you know, um, you know, tethered to your smartphone and all of a sudden this can take a long time. So while this thing is trying to save the file to disk, there's no way to interact with the system right, or with this application. You may still be able to kill it if the operating system lets you do that, but you cannot interact with the application within. So that's the problem when you process input in the main loop, but it's also a very easy way to write these kinds of programs. And that's why you often still, even today, experience that kind of lagginess, right? People just say, oh, I'm gonna look for user input and then I'm gonna do what the user's asking me to, and then as quickly as I can, I'm gonna come back to process more user input. But it's a dangerous way to go, because as soon as something takes longer than you anticipated, and you can never really know how long your operations take as soon as you go beyond your own um, your little world and you do I.O. Um, as soon as you do that and something takes longer than you thought, then your system becomes laggy for the user. So not a great user experience if you have any of those I.O. Um, issues and for sure they will pop up. Right? So basically one of the things you could do here if you were typing keys or also would be maybe to hit the Q, uh, Q key when uh, you're in command mode with VI and that would actually exit the program. So one of the things that it would do in response to the user input is just quitting the, uh, the application. So why we mark that here is because at this point, your program no longer ends at the last line here. It you know, keeps looping back. It runs in an infinite loop, if you like, and there will be one particular subroutine that is the actual exit of your application. Menu-based systems uh, feel quite similar, right? Here's an example. This is Nano, which is another uh, text-based editor on, uh, on Unix. Um, you can start it up if you have a, um, a Mac, for example. You can open up a terminal, see it running. 
if you install the Linux subsystem on Windows, uh, which thankfully you can do now. Um, you, know, you can see that running, or of course on any Linux box. And very similar story, but now we have, for example, here menu keys, right? So you have a menu that's being displayed to the user. This is, of course, much nicer, as we know from um, DIS1, uh, than having to remember commands. But it still means um, that you know, the basic structure tends to be the same. Now, these applications are beginning to get a more specific user interface component. So here you would start to see in the code um, a routine that displays the menu, a routine that scans for input from the menu, and that branches out to different parts of the code based on the input that the user did. The overall structure, of course, however, is still the same. Unless you're smart and you write it so that you actually put your main code or the code that does stuff, like saving a file, into a separate thread. Right? That's, of course, the solution to the problem that we just described with VI. Right? If you save a file and you do that in a separate uh, thread that basically just you know, runs whenever um, it has a chance to, even if the I.O. is slow, your main thread immediately goes back to listening to input. And that is the way out of this lagginess that we talked about. Because then the user, while the thread that is saving is running, while that's happening, the user could do another you know, piece of input and, let's say, cancel a saving uh, process that is uh, in operation. Right? And that's, of course, the thing that gives the user the um, control over making things happen at their own pace. However, if you look at that code and look at what kind of, what kind of input the user can do, it's still quite limited. You basically are limited to you know, control G, control O, control whatever, P, uh, those couple of commands, that's all you can do. So there's still basically a giant switch statement that says which of these 20 things did the user just do. Right? Um, so the application still has a pretty clear control over where things are going at any time. Because you end up in your little menu routine, one of 20 things happens, you branch out in that subroutine, you come back to your menu. So it still feels, as an application developer, that you are, while you're writing your code and thinking through how it runs, you feel that you're in control of where the code is at any given time. And that changes radically with graphical user interfaces. Um, the advance here, of course, was that we moved from character generators to a bitmap display. You'll all remember the Alto, the Star, the Lisa that we talked about in DIS1. Um, and what a lot of people um, forget is that not only did that radically change the user experience, because now I could move a mouse around and click on things, but with that, it also radically changes the application developer experience. Why? Because now we have a completely different way in which you need to structure your software, your application. What happens here is that essentially the user is in control of what the application is doing at any point. And the application really only can reply and react to user events or system events. Um, this is where the so-called callback paradigm comes into play, and this will We'll talk about that a lot um, when we talk about our reference model system. Callbacks, of course, you should all know them if you've done any like Java uh, program with the UI or any, any user interface program with the GUI. Uh, callbacks are where you put the code that reacts to a particular kind of user event, and then you, know, you basically pass control back to the main event loop. Um, as an example here, uh, we have the main thread, which is sort of your event handling thread. Um, and that event handling thread now gets all kinds of input. It gets keyboard input, but it also gets input of the mouse was clicked at location X. Um, or you know, maybe the system says um, a, a floppy disk was just inserted. That was a thing back in the 90s. Um, so all those kinds of things happening uh, will be things that you get as events, you know, different kinds of events, keyboard events, mouse events, whatever. And then you react to those. One of them could be that you are asked to quit your, quit your application. Other things will make you do stuff. But you try to do those um, quickly. And if you cannot do them quickly, if there is the slightest chance that it's something that could take longer, you pass it out to a separate thread. And then that thread runs as fast as it can, but you immediately get back to processing more input from the user. And um, at this point, event handling becomes important. So events came up as, a, as an object and as a concept in application development. Um, and initially, 
people did it like you would probably do it right now, right? If I asked you to write an event handling system, you'd write an application, and the application would say, okay, I'm getting something, an event. Let's look at that event. What is it? What kind of thing is, could it be? Is it a keyboard? Is it a mouse? What kind of key is it? Oh, I know what to do with that key. So you would write your own little event handling main loop in your application, and then you would write additional uh, routines that are called in, in a separate threads that do things like printing stuff or, or saving stuff or drawing complex graphics, stuff like that. But of course, if you now imagine um, a system like this running and it has 10 of these applications, every single application developer has to write their own event handling loop. That's very repetitive code. And if we know one thing about computer scientists is that they are lazy people, right? So if they see, oh, I'm writing the 10th app here and every time I need to write this code that looks at the event that then you know, branches out to one of these 10 different routines and that processes mouse events and if somebody hits you know, command Q, if it's a Mac app, I need to quit my application, this is incredibly boring. So very quickly people realized, well, very quickly meaning it probably took them five to 10 years, um, that it makes much more sense to put this event handling into a routine that the system does and that every application can use. So I call the event handling routine of the system, and it tells me what I need to do. And at that point, the application is basically only a bunch of callback routines. Can you imagine that? So you write your, when your application starts, it builds the user interface, puts buttons and scroll bars and whatnot on the screen, and then it says, I'm done, and I have a couple of routines lined up that are callback routines that do the stuff that I'm supposed to do, like save a file to disk or something. And now it says, dear operating system, go handle events and tell me if I need to do anything. Right? At that point, your application has no longer any like, thread of activity that you can trace. You don't know what's going to happen next. You've given control to the system outside of your own app. And the system then comes back and at some point calls routines. It says, oh, by the way, the user just hit you know, you know, command W, please write the file to disk. And so you only have these little routines where you respond to user in input. Um, and that mean, that's what I mean with uh, you have a system implicit um, event loop. This is sort of our brief history of, of user input, uh, of, of, of um, graphical user interfaces or of user interaction. And people like to call the very first version 0D, as I was saying, then the version where you have a string of characters being passed on in like, you know, um, uh, terminal systems, they, you could call those uh, one-dimensional because there's a one-dimensional string. And with these, uh, people like to say it's sort of two-dimensional because now you have a graphical user interface and there's all kinds of things happening. But I wouldn't take that dimensionality too seriously. It's not very mathematically sound. Uh, but Jacob Nielsen introduced it in his book and a, a bunch of people are referring to it. Um, yes, please. For the graphical user interfaces, um, isn't giving control to the operating system the only way that we could even um, manage, manage such a multi-window, etc. Uh -huh. if, if we yeah. would, each, if each program would handle its own thing, that wouldn't work, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, what you're describing is, is exactly the reality that people my age were exposed to for about five to ten years of their life. Uh, when you had the early systems like the, you know, the Mac or, or the early Windows systems, if anybody ever, I don't know, has anybody ever used, seen a, like a Windows 3 computer? No. Congratulations. Um, because they did that. They did what's called cooperative multitasking. And, and this is where we are getting into a bit of more like really lower level software engineering, but it's important to understand because it impacts the user experience. So with cooperative multitasking, and we'll touch on that again when we get to these systems, you basically are, every application um, voluntarily at some point calls code that passes control to the next application. So it's like we're all really good friends, and developed in California, of course, right? So they're like, oh, we're all hippies, we all love each other, we're all going to be fine. And you know, so I'm you know, app number one, I'm a browser, let's say, right? And I'm doing my thing, and then at some point I say, Oh, I think it's time to let the other people play for a while, so I give control to you, you're the email application, and you do your thing, you fetch a couple emails, you display it on the screen, you're like, oh, I'm gonna give control to the next person who is, I don't know, a word processor running, like you know, an early version of Word or something, and you do your thing and then you say, oh, I think I'm done, I'm gonna give it back to, to Jan. So this is cooperative multitasking, why? Because every application needs to cooperate, right? Uh, and it works. 
It also is actually highly efficient in terms of resources because we don't have any scheduler that bumps us off the CPU and puts us back on and has all that overhead going on. Uh, and that's why this was the only way to make that work um, in the early system, simply because computers were too slow. So you can make that work, but you can imagine if you know, you're the bad guy and you're a mail application and you say, oh, I'm going to fetch all the mail that you know, the user got today and it's you know, 200 megabytes of spam over a telephone line, uh, then that would take an awfully long time. And while he's doing that, he's not giving up control. Right? He's not getting to that point in his code where he passes control to the next um, uh, application. So one application, or maybe there's a bug in an application, and it just sits in a tight infinite loop because there's a programming error in an app. That would actually lock up the entire computer. For, thankfully, it's something you rarely experience today, but if you ever see you know, early systems or systems today that are built on very scarce resources that need to use this kind of system, one app can basically get the computer to grind to a halt. So, yes, that's, it's not a good solution, but it was the only one available in the early times. Back to small talk, actually. Um, I should say something on a, on a meta level here. Uh, you're hearing a lot of stuff that I'm talking about that's not on the slides. Uh, this is also a change we've introduced this year uh, to kind of eat our own dog food because we're always preaching, like, you know, slides need to be empty and they shouldn't be full of text because it's hard to listen and read at the same time. But all of our slides were full of text. So we've moved that text out, but you're going to still get it. Uh, the handouts that we create, the, the PDFs of the slides, will contain the speaker notes that I'm glancing at here while to, as my sort of talking points. So you'll have more content than what you see here right now. We just skimmed that down so that it's easier to process for you folks. All right. Um, let's very briefly... Uh, take maybe a five minute break, get some air into the room, and then we'll talk about the design space of input devices. All right, um, let's, uh, let's continue. Um, just because this came up from a few people here as a, as a question, maybe others have this issue too. Um, if you have not heard DIS1 yet, uh, can I just see another raise of hands who has not heard DIS1 yet? Uh, one, two, three, anybody else? Okay, we three already talked, um, so as I said, DS1 is about what makes a good user interface. DS2 is about how do you build it. So you're going to learn how to build interfaces here. You're not necessarily going to learn how to build great interfaces here because for that you need the design knowledge from DS1. Okay. So go back to DS1 slides and the videos. Sebastian um, can give you access if you need to. Um, the videos are on iTunes U um, uh, uh, as podcasts, so you can, anybody can look at them. With the slides, I'm not sure. Um, and uh, for sure, Make sure you team up with somebody who was in DIS1 last semester, right? so that if these themes come up, this other person can at least tell you what you don't know. Okay? All right. Good. So now, on to the design space of input devices. This is fun. Uh, this is a, uh, a, a framework that lets you understand what different mechanical input devices can actually do and how they are actually much more similar than they might seem at first. Um, the way that this works is um, a so-called a, a morphological approach, which means that in this design space, which was invented by Card, McInlay, and Robinson in 1991, um, you will place uh, devices as points into a parameterized design space, uh, a, a space with coordinates and you know, axes and so on um, that has different parameters along each of these dimensions. Um, does that name ring any bells? This is a DIS1 question, by the way. Cart, McInlay, Robertson? CMN. Yeah, very close to CMN, right? So Cart, McInlay, and uh, Newell, I think, uh, did the CMN model, right? They did this model of how, do you process how people process information. So that's one of the things that you guys could look up if you haven't been to DIS1. Um, and this is the same card and the same... Uh, Sorry, Cart, Moore, and Newell, uh, Cart, McInerney, Rob. So only Cart is the person overlapping here. Stu Cart did this model. Uh, he wasn't the first to propose a design space for input devices. There were others that did that before, Buxton and so on. Um, but he did a very uh, comprehensive one that, that we're going to take a look at now. So it categorizes input devices according to their physical, mechanical, spatial properties. Why is this useful? Uh, because it helps you compare different input devices. This was basically the... Uh, 
you could say the, the, the Cambrian era of input devices. It was an explosion of different designs for input devices. Um, and people were trying to make sense of that. Like, is this actually a new capability or is it just something that lets me do the same things that other devices let me do before? Um, so identifying new modalities, new ways of interacting, but also comparing existing designs was the big goal here. Um, so input devices are points in a large design space. Um, and in order to build an input device, like this, for example, it would actually consist of primitives. So for example, there are four touch buttons on this thing. These would be primitives, you know, building blocks, if you like, that you then assemble the larger uh, input device from. And the composition, how you assemble them into the larger input device, were composition operators. Um, here's, a, here's the description of how an input device is defined. So an input device is a tuple, mathematically speaking, um, and it starts out with the uh, manipulation operator. So this is basically describing how do I manipulate this thing? How do I work with this thing? What do I do? Um, do I move it around? Or do I, like a touchscreen on a smartphone, just apply pressure to it? Or uh, do I rotate it like a dial? You know, or do I apply rotary force? That's also obviously a, position, although, a possibility, although it's much less uh, common. And as we'll see in a moment, these positioning or, or inputs could be absolute or relative values. Uh, we'll talk about what that means in a, in a second. So this is the first part. The next one, then, is the input domain, which says, uh, what is the user doing physically to move this? Is he, for example, rotating his hand from, let's say, 0 degrees to 180 degrees, like a half turn on a dial? Next up, then, comes the, um, the device state, uh, which says, what do I need to write down to describe what state the device is currently in? Do I need to know the current angle of the, of the knob, or is there a, a force being applied to it, or what are the variables that I need to capture to describe the device? Next up, then, is what's called a resolution function. This function maps from the input device state to the output device state. Why is your computer talking to, to you, René? I don't know. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's a Mac. They do that. Okay. Um, so the resolution function tells us how the input device, uh, the input that device gets is mapped to an output that it creates. And of course, the output domain uh, describes what kind of variables it outputs. For example, if you have a knob that you turn from 0 to 180, but it's a knob on a washing machine uh, that only has like four positions, like off and program A, B, C, you might have just turned it from program off to program C. And then finally, there's additional work properties, which is just a catch-all if there's anything else I want to describe about this device and capture to put it into my space. So this is kind of abstract, I know, and it's kind of hard to imagine what, what this is supposed to mean. So we're going to look at a very simple example. Um, this is an old-school radio, like you know, the one that you might see uh, at your grandparents' house, or if you're a re really hip, cool hipster, you might buy one of those today in, in, in like, you know, posh brushed aluminum or uh, veneer wood. Uh, so it's, it's a, sort of an analog radio that has a volume knob that you can turn, similar to like, you know, your volume knob in your car radio maybe. Um, it has a selection of, you know, it's off or you go to the AM band or the FM band. Um, and it has a station dial that you can turn. Up here is a um, little display that shows which uh, frequency you currently picked, where you'll have a little slider moving, you know, back and forth as you turn that station dial. Here's the slider shown in a, as a little graphic that sits up there. Now let's look at the volume knob first. Um, the volume knob is something that, how do I manipulate it? I rotate it, so that's what the R stands for. In which axis am I rotating it? It's only one axis, right? It rotates around a single axis. There's no more that I'm doing to it. And is it X, Y, or Z? Well, you know, Cart just picked a um, convention and said, um, X is typically, if I'm interacting with something, X is horizontal, Y is vertical, and Z is basically away from me. Right? So away from the user is the Z axis. So in this case, this is the Z axis. I'm rotating the style around 
the z-axis, okay? Um, is it an absolute or relative input? What do you guys think? Any ideas? The question you need to ask yourself is, can I, if I look at the device at any moment in time, can I, can I say what the current state is just from the current position? Then it's an absolute device. Or do I need to know how it just got there? Yeah? Yeah, absolutely. It is absolute, exactly. Because at any point in time, I just need to look at the dial and it'll pin there, and I can see exactly it's at, you know, 90 degrees, for example. It doesn't matter where it was before. If it's now at 90 degrees, that's the message that it's sending. The mouse, for example, is different, where it depends on where you move, how you moved it, where it got, how it got to where it is. Uh, that would be a relative device. Yes? So this only regards the state of uh, the input device, not the representation that it represents. Mm -hmm. For example, if mm -hmm. I turn the volume to like 50%, mm -hmm. I still don't know how loud it will be. Absolutely. That's right. Uh, it's, very, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a danger to think too far with this, with this model and go into what does this mean in the application. We're not going to look at the application. We really cut it off right behind you know, the, the front plate, basically, of those devices. That's why this device um, uh, design space is really about the mechanical interactions I'm having with these devices. We're going to talk about the mappings into the app later when we get to the station button. Um, so it's an absolute uh, rotation around the z-axis because at any point I just need to know the angle here between, uh, in this case, 0 degrees and 270. So this lets it, you know, that can be turned by 3 quarters of a, of a full rotation. And we're going to call it 0 degrees to 270 degrees simply because it's convenient, right? So what we pick here as numbers isn't that important uh, as long as it, it, uh, it makes sense to us from a, from a user point of view. The current state of it, therefore, is the current rotary, uh, rotation, uh, which is going to be a value between 0 and 270, right? It's a continuous value anywhere between those. That's what the user is doing with it. And the resolution function is an identity function. This device, on a mechanical level, doesn't do anything to our input. It doesn't discretize it. It doesn't chop it off into individual values, for example. Um, it just outputs the same thing. So it outputs 0 to 270, um, same as the input. So there's nothing happening. There's not very exciting. We don't have any additional work properties to find. We're leaving these empty for all of these devices, so we're not worried about those. Um, so that's basically what this input device is doing. It basically takes the user's rotation from 0 to 270, and that's exactly kind of you know, what you get at the output. And then, of course, here's the mapping to the application to get to your point. What happens later is that it takes the zero point, means zero decibels, and 270 is going to mean 270 times some constant c that we can compute in decibels, you know, in, in loudness. And this function could be defined differently, but that's behind sort of the, the front plate. Let's look at the selection button. Almost the same, right? It has also rotation around the z-axis, also defined by its current position, so it's absolute. And the input is the current state between 0 and 90. Notice that this is still a continuous interval. I can turn this button from 0 to 90 degrees continuously, but it will click into place at only three points. And those three points here described with 0, 45, and 90 degrees are the points where we'll actually transmit something useful. So the output of this device is only one of three different states not a continuous value anymore, like with the volume button. That's why the resolution function now is this uh, sort of selection function that goes from 0, 45, 90 cents, one of these three values. And we, you could call these values differently. We're just using the angles here um, to, describe the, uh, to describe them as different uh, distinct values. <coughs> and then, of course, this gets mapped in the application, in this case the radio electronics, to off AM band or FM band. Next up, the station button, that's a little more complicated. First of all, this is a station button that I need to explain how it works so that you see why it is modeled the way that it is modeled. It is not a button that I can basically turn to the left and I'm at the left end of the band and then I turn it by, let's say, 270 degrees and I'm at the right end. That would be way too coarse. Right? I couldn't pick a, an exact station. So you can turn it many times. Right? In fact, 
you can turn it endlessly. But at some point, if you've moved the slider on the scale all the way to the right and it hits the top end of the scale, you can still turn it, but it'll be a little harder to turn. And maybe you've experienced those kinds of knobs, right? You can turn them infinitely, but they hit this kind of resistance. You can, it's harder to turn them, but they don't break, right? So they turn endlessly, but they have the stop. And then if you go back, they immediately move the, the scale down again as soon as you start turning left, no matter how long you turn it to the right. So this is a relative position because here, if you looked at this knob, it doesn't even have a marker because the marker doesn't make sense, right? Its current position doesn't tell you what the current um, frequency is. You can't see that from the knob. Um, you can only tell that you will be increasing the frequency if you turn the knob to the right and you'll be decreasing it to the left. So it's really the whole range of real numbers that you could say is the input, because it's not limited to, the, to a minimum or maximum value, if we think about this. And then the current state is still what its rotational value is, and the resolution is still the identity. It outputs that continuous increasing or decreasing number um, as a knob. Right? So that's what's, what's going out of it. But now something interesting happens. You take that number that keeps going down or up, depending on where I'm turning this thing, and I'm sending it, not directly to the application of the radio, I'm sending it to this slider up here. And you might all say, well, wait, that's an output device. I thought we were talking about input devices. But actually, because the slider has a mechanical thing that only makes it go up to 108 megahertz or something, um, and then stops, it actually has an input device quality as well, because it limits what is going to be sent onto the radio. Right? So the slider, if you move it all the way to the right, stops at the maximum frequency, and that's the frequency that's going to send, be sent down into the radio electronics, no matter how you keep turning your, your knob. So the output from the knob, that is continuous and endless, if you like, gets sent to the slider, which only has a limited range, because the slider only goes from a minimum frequency to a maximum frequency, or from a position zero of this thing, to some position over here. And that's modeled over here. So this, um, uh, this manipulation op uh, operator here is a positional operation that moves linearly the slider here from one start value to one end value. You can pick anything here. Zero to five is a random uh, choice of numbers to mark the left and the right end of the scale. And the current state of that slider is is captured by a variable x. And the resolution function of that is going to be some mapping of uh, the left end here to some mapping of the right end here. This is not really crucial to map this, but the important thing is that we understand that the output here will only ever be a limited interval from a minimum to a maximum value because the slider doesn't go any further. And then it takes that output and maps it to some kind of um, frequency on the radio electronics. So in combination, this button and the slider are actually creating a limited output between minimum and maximum frequency, whereas the, slide, the, the rotation knob here itself is unlimited and is therefore a relative input device. You've noticed that we've used these double arrows here, and this is important. They mean that I'm taking one input from an input device and moving it onto another stage for processing. It's basically daisy chaining things, um, connecting them up that way. This is one way to compose input devices. But we've also seen that we have a volume knob and a selection knob and a station knob all boxed up in this radio, and actually the slider here as well. So we somehow, if you want to describe the radio as an input device in this design space, you somehow need to combine these basic building blocks into the input device as a whole. And that's done with another kind of composition. Um, so we call this the, um, the um, layout composition. So there's three kinds of compositions. The connect that you saw when one stage moves data to the next, daisy chaining things. There is the Layout, when you just put stuff into the same box, if you like, into the same device. And then there's this third one called merge, which we're talking about here, which means you take two basic inputs and you put them together so that they are indistinguishable from each other. You can't use them individually. Best example, way before mice worked with, with, a, with an optical laser sensor, 
they used little rubber balls. Anybody ever use one of those? They're great collectors of fluff from your desktop, right? So um, they, they had two sensors in there, two rolling little pins that would turn into you know, this direction or this direction based on how you move the rubber ball around. So there was two rotary sensors in there that would pick up how the mouse is being moved along the X and the Y axis. But in practice, you could never just use one without the other because as soon as you move it to one side, you would basically also be you know, using the other one a little bit. So that's what happens on the mouse when you take the, the X rolling you know, ball controller and the Y rolling ball controller and you put them together, they basically are merged into an XY controller. That's one operation, merge. We mark this with a, with a, a straight line in this program. Sorry, I can turn that off. Um, the second way to do this is in a way that you do layout. So let's say we have you know, combined these two X and Y controllers into the mouse. Now we're going to put some buttons on the mouse. So here are three buttons. We put them on the mouse in the same box as the, as the XY controller. So we've now created a layout operation. So the, the buttons and the, the remaining mouse here are merged in the layout operation to have a button with, um, uh, to have a mouse with buttons. And the third thing you can do is what we've already seen, the connect operation. For example, the mouse with its buttons creates relative output, right? I can never tell if I look at a mouse on a de desk, I don't know its position. I only know if I move it to the right or left or up or down uh, that it's being moved from its last position. So it's a relative input device, but once I pass it on to the mouse pointer on the screen, all of a sudden we have an absolute input device because the mouse pointer on the screen is always at some XY coordinate that I can pinpoint and look at it and know it right there. I don't need to know its history, it's defined by its current position. So in combination, they make up an absolute input device, but the mouse itself is only a relative one. This is the same kind of connection we had when we send the volume knob output to the electronics of the radio or when we send the station knob to the station um, slider that was moving back and forth. So this double line is the connect operator. Mathematically, you can look at merge as if you want the Cartesian product, right? So we have all the values from the X mouse sensor and we have all the values from the Y mouse sensor and what the mouse gives us as a whole is really an XY coordinate pair. Um, as an uh, sort of another example of that, um, I don't know whether we still have one of those here. Um, Apple remotes? Probably not, right? They're a good example because there's a, there's a button on, a, on, on the, the, um, like the Apple TV remote, for example, that, you, that controls volume and it's like, a, it's like a bridge button. So you can press it down on the, on the, on the plus button, it goes like this, or you press the minus button, it goes like this. But you cannot press both at the same time, right? It doesn't make sense. So that would be an example where you're combining two buttons, the up and the down button, into, in this Cartesian product, into a, a merged input device that how many different states does it have? How many different states do you have on a, on a up or down push button control? Yeah? Uh, I would say three, because not pressed and then plus and uh, minus. Exactly. And the fourth one, both pressed, doesn't exist, right? Because physically it's not possible from the design of the button. Exactly. Okay. Uh, and layout, the, the spatial collocation, um, is different from merge because you can operate, uh, you can pick up the mouse and just operate the buttons, for example, or you can just move the mouse around without pressing the buttons easily. They are really separate conceptually, whereas with the two X and Y sensors, they are merged together so that they are really only usable as a, as a team, if you like. Now here's the uh, depiction of what this thing looks like. This is Card's design space, and he put a lot of devices into it. Some of the devices uh, he took out of prior research, so Foley, uh, a big computer graphics guy um, from the 90s, and Bill Buxton, big HCI guy from the 80s, 90s, and, and even today, uh, and you know, they both made their own versions of this design space, and he placed their, he showed that all the, place, uh, the devices that they placed, he could also place in his design space. So he was showing my design space is better than your design space. Um, 
So don't worry too much about the shape of these. It's just telling you which literature they're coming from. But the interesting thing is, um, this is actually not the complete design space. This is not depicting the complete design space. Because remember, the actual design space is this tuple of you know, manipulation operator, input domain, output domain, resolution function, work properties, state, and so on. What we're seeing here is only the if you like, the manipulation operator, how it's defined. And how is that done? Well, we've got, on the left-hand side, we've got all the linear movement that, that devices do. Like, when you move a mouse on a, on a table, you're moving it in a linear direction. On the right, we have things that you, the user moves in rotary uh, fashion, for example, when you're turning uh, a dial, right? The radio is over here with its, its various controllers, volume and, and, this, and the uh, band selection. Each of these is divided further into x, y, and z axis, pretty simple, 3D space, and x, y, and 3 rotary axis for this part. And now we're gonna look at why are things placed on the left or right-hand side here in this. That's because the resolution of this input uh, design point here is given by where you place it in the column. So devices like a button that only have two states on and off, you, you've got two travel positions of the button, pressed or not pressed, will end up on the left hand side. So for example, here's a keyboard. A keyboard has 90 buttons, that's what the number inside the circle says, but each of these buttons only has two positions. That's why it ends up on the left hand side of this column where the resolution is basically only two different states. It's also, for, to stay with the keyboard button, placed in the linear area because buttons travel linearly, right, up and down. And it's in the z-axis because it's, you know, when you press a button, you're moving your finger away uh, from the user. But like I said, this is sort of a convention, um, not really mathematically uh, uh, fixed. All of those up here, which is the biggest part of space, are absolute position. Absolute position means um, that it is a device that is defined by its current position in space. So the button is either pressed or not pressed. I can tell at any mo moment to just by just looking at it what it's doing. Below that is the area with relative position. So here we have all the devices that are moved around, like the mouse, for example, and that only transmit changes in position. Below that, we have the two rows here, that are related to force. So absolute force and relative force. Absolute force are things that you apply a certain force to and they sense it but without actually being moved in any meaningful way. These are, as you can see, pressure pad is you know, similar to like a force sensitive touch screen. So like you know, modern smartphones that, have, that can detect not just touch but actually the force with which you touch uh, would fall into that category. And as you can see, delta force, a device that has relative changes in force, is a very obscure area that is empty in this space. No devices fall into that category. And again, remember the left-hand side is linear stuff, the right-hand side is rotary stuff. That also applies to um, force devices, you know, devices that you turn without really turning them, but you just apply rotary force, fall into the right-hand side. Devices that you apply linear force to by pressing on them, fall into the left side. So this space looks complex, but let's look at a few devices that have been placed in here. I've already talked about the keyboard, right? So the keyboard, absolute position in Z axis, two, two points only. So every keyboard button goes up here, and we've got a lot, of, a lot of them on the keyboard, so we put a number in there. We could also put 90 dots on the left hand side in this box here. That would also be correct. If you did that, then you would have to group them all together with a dotted line because they're all in the same box, but they can be operated independently. So it's a layout operation. Next up, the radio. So the radio has its volume knob that is a rotation around the z-axis, um, and it's absolute. That's why it's up in the absolute position, not in the relative position. And it has a lot of uh, resolution, not infinite, but you know, it's, it's a continuous selection. So essentially it is infinite, even though it's just an interval, because we can pick any value in between, right? It's not discrete, chopped up into a few different states. 
The selection button, however, is. So it's in the same box, but it only has three different states that it can be at. That's why it's on the left-hand side here. So you can see that the placement here is not happening by the input domain, but actually happening by the output domain, basically telling you how many different states does the device have and how many different states does it therefore communicate to the rest of the chain. And finally, the station button is a little weirder. It is actually a relative position rotation around the z-axis, that's the first part, which is then connected with the connect operator to the um, slider on the, on the dial up there in, in the frequency band, which is an absolute position along the x-axis with infinite resolution, but only a limited range, so it's absolute. All right. And all of those, volume, selection, and station, are grouped together with a dotted line to say that's the radio as an input device. One more, the mouse. The mouse has a controller to move it along the x-axis. This is, again, talking about the classical ball-based mouse because it's easier to imagine with that. It's a better example. Um, so that is a controller along the x-axis, but it's relative. We don't know what the current state is. We only know we just moved it left or right. Same thing for the y-axis, up and down on the table. These two are near infinite because, you know, they have very high resolution. They're not just a few different states. And we connect them with a, connect, uh, with, a, with a straight line. So they are connected with the merge operator. So they are merged into one input device. And then we have buttons on the mouse. In this case, it's a three-button three mouse, um, linear, absolute, z-axis, just like the keyboard, just three of them instead of 90. And we connect those to, with a dotted line because they are laid out on the same box as the, as the mouse ball uh, that's inside the mouse. There are lots of other devices in here um, that uh, you guys can take a look at at home, maybe look them up, light pens, and some of these you might know, some of them uh, you may not be aware of. Most of them probably you won't be aware of because, as like I said, these were the, those were the Cambrian explosion of input devices. Most of them were actually not a success, but they were only documented in research papers and didn't find an application in practice. The touchscreen, however, you know, 20, 30 years later um, is, you know, omnipresent, right? So um, there's always this 1% of research that um, then changes the world in practice. All right, now you've got to think. So I'd like you guys to just team up with your, with your buddy who's sitting next to you and think about um, maybe get out a piece of paper and sketch how would you place this racing controller in the design space of input devices. Let's explain the racing controller real quick. It has a steering wheel that you can turn. It has eight buttons on it. These are marked over here. Um, and it has a rotary switch with five states. That's the one over here. And it has two pedals uh, that you press with your, with your foot, these two here. Um, the steering wheel, we're going to assume for simplicity that it only can have one full rotation, no more. Okay. Um, so get out a piece of paper, sketch the design space. I'm going to go back to the design space so you can see what it looks like. Um, and then I'm going to go back to this page. Let's gather up here. So uh, first question, um, where are we placing the, uh, let's start simple, the, the buttons, the eight buttons, where do those go? Anybody? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, linear, push, and Z. Okay, so uh, this is not push, this is position, position, but you're right. Yeah, linear, absolute position on the Z-axis. And where in there, left or right? Uh, left. On left, because only two states, right. Um, where does the uh, rotary switch go? Yeah, good. Rotationary uh, Z, um, it's position two, and it's, it seems to be a bit on left, maybe in the middle. Yeah, so... We've got absolute rotation around the z-axis, so it's in this box, towards the left, uh, because it has five states, which is not a lot, but more than two, right? And this, the scale here it tends to be sort of logarithmic in nature. Um, next up, the, uh, the steering wheel. Yes. Yeah, we weren't so sure about the steering wheel. Okay. Um, it's for sure in rotation uh, Z, mm -hmm. but we were not sure about uh, whether it's uh, uh, 
uh, absolute or relative. Okay. Because it could have two states if you turn it the, like the whole way. Okay. You wouldn't know um, if it's uh, fully rotated. Okay. Or not. Okay. So here's an interesting point. Uh, if even if the the steering wheel did two full rotations. Um, you could still call it an absolute device because if it hits a st stop at one rotation and then you turn it twice and then it hits a stop again, then it would basically have a degree from zero through 360 all the way through 720. And by looking at it, you wouldn't, you know, as a user, you wouldn't know, but the system itself, if you like, would know, right? If there's like a potentiometer in there that does two full turns, it would actually give you a continuously increasing or decreasing value resistance value or whatever it is electronically throughout this movement. So I think that actually points out the description I gave, maybe not the most helpful one saying like, if you can look at it and you know the state, then that's an absolute device. A better definition is, is does the device itself sort of from looking at its internals know exactly where it is, right? It, does it, can it at any time, can you ask the device what's your state and it can answer that precisely, okay? All right, so that's the, that's the, um, um, that's the steering wheel, and now onto the foot pedals. Those were a little um, trickier, and there's actually more than one right answer to this. Yeah. There are, I think there are rotation on the uh, x-axis. Okay. F. Okay, so a rot rotary x-axis so far, yes. Um, F, because the more force you put, the more gravity. So that's the thing. Um, don't confuse force with devices that, that give you resistance to their operation. When you have a force input device, it really only senses the force, it doesn't move. Like your touch screen on your smartphone, when you press harder, if you've got a modern smartphone, it notices that, but it doesn't actually move in any meaningful way, right? Uh, maybe microns, but you can't tell. So this is not a force input device. It still only has a potentiometer in there, some sensor that picks up the rotation around this axis. But it has a spring that pushes it back to the beginning, right? But that's not making it a force input device. Right, it doesn't depend on the fact that you need to exert some force to push it down. Um, yeah, so absolute, yes, because the current position tells you where it is. Um, so we put it into uh, rotation around the x-axis, um, absolute, um, and towards the left or towards the right? What do you guys think? Left or right? Help him out. Yeah? To the right. Why? Um, because it's like continuous. It's a continuous controller. Right. If there was some discreteness later on applied to it through like a computer filtering the data and then only putting it into one of five bins, that's a different story, right? The controller itself could deliver a continuous output using a you know, potentiometer, for example. Right. Uh, you could also, however, think about the pedals as being sort of linear if you considered the foot of the user moving essentially forward and backwards away from them and back towards them. That would also be okay. At that point, you can see this is not a model that always gives you a 100% clear-cut answer. You know, welcome to user interfaces and designing interactive systems. One, you saw lots of examples of, you know, it's not black and white. It's not pure mathematics. Um, but the point of the design space is really to give, you, to give you a tool to think about input devices in this way, right? To think about what can they do. So we've got that placement here um, with the different uh, buttons and, uh, and, and pedals and controllers. All right, good. Uh, so the most important point that you should take away from this is that the design space gives you a way to reason about input devices, to think about them and then to think about what can I do with these devices. And are two devices basically equally powerful from this, because they end up in the same spot in the design space, even though they may look radically different? Simple question. Um, is this space complete? Meaning, can I put every input device into this space? Yeah? Uh, actually, how about you? Yeah. yeah. Oh. Yes. Okay, um, <laughs> uh, I guess no, but some speech. Uh-huh. Uh, exactly. Uh, yeah, exactly. There's, there's inputs that are not mechanical manipulation of things, right? Like speech, for example. Um, that wouldn't be able to be modeled in this, in this space uh, in any meaningful way. But that's okay, right? This is focusing on mechanical input devices. That's why it's, um, why it's called that. Um, 
Could anybody think of other um, modalities that uh, that this is not covering? Yeah. Brightness or darkness. Okay. So if I had a, an input device that reacted to like you know light or or no light, um, that wouldn't be picked up by this. Now, as people, we cannot naturally generate light, right? So uh, most of the times, well, I can't. I don't know about you guys. Um, most times, these light sensors are actually used to, for example, enable some kind of, again, mechanical movement of the user. Let's say I have a light sensor, and if I, if I put my hand over it, then it you know, turns off like the watch if it's on. If I do this, and it turns off because it, you know, it's covered. So if in, in the way that it maybe actually asks the user to make a mechanical movement, you may be able to place it. But yes, there may be cases where that doesn't work out. So, but already, this, this play space, the space gives you ideas for new devices. You can basically just put circles into different corners, connect them, and then think about what kind of device is that? You know, what could that be? Now, there's more we can do with this space. It's actually quite a useful design tool to think about this. First of all, you can look at points. You can put a device in there, and then you can start asking yourself certain questions. For example, um, how expressive is a device? What that means is, um, how precisely does it convey my meaning? Um, so, for example, if you say you have a, uh, a device that has much, few, uh, much more output values than input values, then that means that if I do my input, I actually cannot pick all the legal output values correctly. Um, an example would be um, a device that um, you know, has this rasterization, but actually all the values in between would also be correct values, but I can't get to them because the device snaps to them. If the input space is bigger than the output, then I can specify illegal values. What's an example? Uh, again, the station selector, where you are only supposed to get out 0, 45, or 90, but if it wouldn't snap into place, but would let me pick all the values in between two, then I could actually send information into the device that doesn't correspond to a meaningful output. So the device needs to somehow make sure that it creates that mapping correctly. Um, we have other examples of this. Uh, for example, if you have, you've probably experienced this. If you've ever tried to control, you, has anybody ever tried to control their mouse with cursor keys? Right? Sometimes you need to do that. You'll notice they jump, right? The mouse jumps by a few pixels. And there's this like tiny button that you're supposed to hit and you jump and ah, it's on the right. And you jump back, ah, oh, it's on the left. And how do I you know, make it jump in micro steps? So as soon as that's not possible, you would have this case where you cannot actually specify all the output values that you would like to specify. It's an example for a mismatch between input and output. So that's one way to, to use this. This is about the expressiveness of, of devices. Another thing that we can look at is the effectiveness of devices. So this asks, how well can we communicate our intention? Um, there's lots of different value, uh, ways you can me measure that. Um, you can measure it with a performance test, like in the DIS-1, you could run a classical user study, performance study, measure an A-B comparison, and see, for example, um, is the mouse compared to the track pen, you know, like the little, these little rubbers that are inside, um, or against, let's compare it to the, the trackpad, right, that you have on your laptop. Mouse versus trackpad. Let users just do um, uh, user input and target acquisition, fits law kind of tasks, and let's compare how they perform. And if you do that, you'd probably find that one works better than the other. And then you can look at, okay, where does this one device sit in this design space? Where does this other device sit in this design space? Maybe there's a pattern there. Maybe you know, devices that support certain kinds of movements are, tend to be more performant than others. For example, one reason why the force input thing is so empty is that we're actually, as humans, not very good at creating lots of different values of applied force reliably. It's really hard to control force precisely and, and to get like exactly to level 5 out of 10 for force. We're much better with this with physical movements. So that's why force devices are not, uh, don't have that same bandwidth of being able to create lots of precise input in a quick, uh, in a quick way. Um, this is an example of um, uh, another way of visualizing a, a certain figure of, of merit. This is a pragmatic figure of merit. What I mean by this is, this is showing how much space this thing is going to take up on your desk. 
So let's look at the mouse. The mouse takes up some space on your, on your table, but it's not too bad, right? We've probably all, in a, in a, you know, in a pinch, been sitting there and moved our mouse over our leg on, you know, on our pants, right? And it kind of works if you really need to. Um, but you need about maybe, you know, that kind of size of, of space for it. Um, so it's fairly small. If you have a tablet, a graphics tablet, to actually be able to control things as precisely as you can with the mouse, it actually needs to get pretty large. And these two rings around here show the footprint of the device for a small monitor and for a big monitor. With a tablet, if you have a larger monitor, higher resolution, you actually also need a larger tablet to still be able to control to get to every point on your screen. If you have a mouse, you, don't, you need maybe a little bigger mouse pad, but you don't need it to be that much bigger as the monitor has grown in size. So the mouse is pretty effective, especially with larger screens. That's why it's been one of the reasons why it's been uh, used a lot. A light pen, on the other hand, which is one of those things that you may remember from the video in DIS1. Anybody remember which one that was in? Where did we see a light pen in action? Yeah? Was it the Sketchpad demo? Sketchpad, yes. 100 points for long-term memory for you, sir. Um, so the, the, the guy in the black and white video that was like tapping and, and drawing on this like weird oscilloscope like screen and drawing shapes, that was from like, the, um, the, the 50s, 60s stuff. This was a light pen. Um, that doesn't need any additional space, right? Because I already have my monitor. I'm tapping on the monitor. It takes up a tiny amount of space when it's sitting on my desk, right? But it's really small. It doesn't get more when the monitor gets bigger. So no additional space wasted on your on your workbench. Maybe that's something, you know, somebody who's designing an, uh, an IT system for lots of office workers needs to think about, like how much space does this device take up on every person's desk? How big need, do the desks need to be? And there are some other examples, for example, a joystick um, takes up very little space too, right? It only moves um, rotary basically around um, these two axes and it, it doesn't move around on the table. It just, you know, you move it with your fingers. So also very little, very small footprint. Similarly with a trackball, you know, trackball, old school mouse turned up on its belly and uh, basically you move a ball around like a big marble and you move it with your hand. Um, doesn't take up any more space if the screen gets bigger because it's a relative device, right? So we can see here that a lot of these relative devices take up very little space whereas some of the absolute ones take up a lot of space, others don't. So this is, and of course rotary ones tend to turn, take up very little space because they only rotate, they don't move around, right? So we can see how this design space is telling us things about different kinds of input devices, and we can create comparisons. So the quick, as a quick glance, we can see the tablet and to a certain degree the mouse are the most expensive devices in terms of space they take up, uh, with the tablet being significantly worse, especially as screens get larger. That's the method, message that the design space can tell you if you put it in place here. So we've added to the design space basically, we said the size of the dot or the circle now communicates the device footprint, right? That's an addition to the design space that was done just to show this particular feature. But the design space helped us to place devices and to put related devices together. All right, so that wraps up our discussion of the uh, design space. Um, should we we can probably uh, talk about the Windows system architecture and get into that and then, um, or should we maybe make sure that we cover, let's cover the, the administrative stuff first, this, this, the will I get a seat stuff, yeah? Yeah, we, we, we're gonna get that in here. I just wanna make sure um, that we get this in here now before people need to maybe leave for, for other classes. Um, this is a question that may be going around in your mind. Um, we currently seem to be doing quite okay. We have about 50 seats in this class that we can give away. Um, again, because we're doing intense um, uh, coaching with the assignments and so on. But we're currently fine. I think we're well below that number. Um, so if we should see more people signing up, sometimes there's still an onrush in the first couple of days of more people coming, uh, we'll give priority to master students uh, over bachelor students. Sorry, but I think you won't have a problem like I was saying. Uh, we'll give priority to exchange students because they can only do this this one. So, congratulations, Erasmus student. Um, you can increase your priority. Otherwise, you know, if you've visited, if you've heard DIS one before, of course. Um, the one thing we want everybody really to do, if you want to take this class, because I don't want you to take up a space and then you know, in two or three weeks, say, eh, maybe not. Um, please sign and hand in the declaration of compliance that you'll find on the website. 
um, in the first lab that's going to be in April 8th. So that's this coming Monday. Right? Um, please sign it and hand it in during the lab so that we know uh, you're committed to this class and you've read it uh, and obviously are, are abiding by it. Nothing surprising in there. Um, well, immediately after the lab on, on the 8th, we can announce on Tuesday, right? The day after the lab, we can say if you guys got a space. But if no weird things happen, I think we're fine because I'm not seeing more than maybe 30 people here right now in the room. So um, a first glimpse at the, the topic of Windows systems and the Windows system architecture. Um, by the way, before we start this, one more thing. Uh, we will have the paper that describes the design space of input devices for you as a reading assignment. So definitely read that paper. This is required because it goes into more detail uh, than what we have been able to cover here in the slides. And it gives you a really much better grasp of the, of the design space. So this is a, it's a bit of a lengthy paper, and a bit of a dense read, but um, you'll have some time because there's no other assignments um, this week that we're giving out. First assignment, the regular assignment, will come out on Monday and then won't be due until the week uh, the Monday after that. Um, and the, the paper will be an average how online L2P modal blah, blah, something. <laughs> It'll be available by going to the jump page and clicking the right link. Okay, so uh, window systems. We're gonna take a look first at what window systems are supposed to do uh, so that you get a sense for what they are and what, what we might be looking for. Um, Windows systems have uh, three very, very basic tasks. They need to handle input, uh, which means you know, I'm doing something, tapping on the keyboard, clicking a mouse, and it needs to be passed on uh, to the window system and from there on to the right application. They need to handle output, right? An application wants to render something, it needs to go into the right window and the right position on the screen, it needs to be shown to the user. Um, and then, of course, it needs to do what's called window management. We're currently talking mostly about desktop uh, window systems. That's the best way to imagine this, although similar things are happening on mobile devices. But let's stay with the desktop for the moment, um, which means basically um, an app can move a window around if it wants to or it can do something to it, but the user wants to, in, in the end, do that, right? You want to have controls to be able to move an, uh, an application's output from here over to here because you want to put that other window next to it. Um, and there's a lot going on there that we, don't, we take for granted, uh, but technically it's quite complex what needs to happen to make that, to make that work. Um, so that means rearranging windows, you know, maybe you're drawing, an app is drawing into a window, but it's behind a window. How does the app, you know, how does the system know that this is not supposed to show, that this is not actually gonna get you know, into pixels on the screen? Um, menu bars around windows where you can close and minimize and maximize them, those need to somehow be supported and, you don't want every app to implement that for itself, right? This is clearly a system task. So those are the basic things to do. Handle input, output, and window management. Now, what are we looking for in a window system? There's a whole bunch of things. Um, what we need it to do, it needs to be independent of the hardware and operating system so that it creates a layer on top of that so that I can change underlying things um, beneath that uh, without having to completely change the window system. The user and the applications running on that window system don't want to have to deal with changes in the lower belly of the system every time. Um, so for example, even though this has a radically different uh, hardware than, than this Mac, they run the same you know, window system and applications can continue to run on them even though the hardware is different. So it's a part of the operating system and how, it's how it is integrated into the operating system really varies widely. We'll see all sorts of ways of integrating or not integrating it into the OS. We want it, of course, to be fast. Surprise, surprise. Again, this is DIS1 knowledge, right? Um, if you have more than a few milliseconds of delay for basic operations like moving a window around or, or reacting to user clicks or redrawing the cursor, then it starts really to feel very, very laggy and, and, and bad as a user experience. It's nice if you can customize your UI, right? Maybe you have a, a, you know, a, a color blindness or something and you need it to look different. Or maybe you're in a dark environment and you want your interface to be in white on black rather than black on white. Um, those kinds of things should be adjustable. Or maybe you want to operate it much more with the keyboard than with the mouse. Um, or maybe you want to change the shortcuts for certain com uh, commands to be more consistent with what you're used to. Those kinds of customizability are 
very helpful to have in a Windows system. Um, of course, input and output need to happen in parallel now. So while one application is drawing, I want to be able to send commands to this application, going back to our discussion earlier about you know, multi-threading. But I want to also, of course, interact with multiple applications at the same time. Um, I want to be able to uh, handle multimedia output. So it's not just drawing you know, pixels on the screen, but it's about playing videos, playing audio, microphone input. All those kinds of things need to somehow be passed onto the right app or from the app um, onto the system. Um, notice how rarely you hear uh, out of your speakers two audio sources playing at the same time, even though you might be having a YouTube video running and then you switch over to your music player. Somehow it knows not to just you know, garble everything together. So that also applies for audio. Um, and then, of course, we want support for more than just the mouse and keyboard. Uh, we want to be able to use you know, whatever, trackballs or maybe you know, uh, graphics pens, graphics tablets, all those kinds of devices um, for input and, and output. So that's basic requirements. We can look at it from a different point of view. If we ask ourselves, which are the, the sort of the, the parameters where, where we, if we have a scorecard to say, oh, this Windows system is 10 out of 10 for this and 8 out of 10 for this, what would be some criteria that we can, we can compare Windows systems against uh, so that we get a sense of how good is this for this particular purpose? Uh, some of these um, things that readily come to mind, of course, is um, which platforms does it run on? Or um, how productive am I when I write apps with it? Is it going to be really hard to use this Windows system, or is it super easy to write an app with it? How well does it handle uh, parallelism? External parallelism means that I can have different applications receive user input at the same time, so I've got two windows up. Um, for example, if you think about mobile input system, mobile Windows systems, until recently, there was only always going to be one app on a mobile device that you would talk to, right? Now we've got sort of, you know, the iPad has split screen mode and we're getting back some of the features that we're used to from the desktop of running applications side by side. But also, of course, we want to make sure that these applications are actual parallel processes internally so that we don't have this collaborative multitasking that we talked about earlier where one app will slow everything down if it breaks. Um, performance, um, so how much does it use resources? How much latency does it create? Um, is a major issue these days. Um, if you look at a modern Windows system with all its alpha blending and sh drop shadows of windows and the, around f their frames and stuff like this, there's a lot going on that actually takes up a reasonable amount of computing time. Um, in some applications you find, or in some systems, you find that up to 90% of the processing power is actually being used for the user interface, simply because rendering it and making it happen and being quick and responding takes up a lot of time. Um, some other criteria uh, would be how extensible is it? How adaptable? Extensibility means um, if I have a Windows system and it supports a bunch of interface components like scroll bars and buttons and so on, and now I come up with a new kind of um, user interface uh, widget, like let's say I want to create a button that has a, an image on the button rather than just text. Can I extend the Windows system to have that? Can I add this new user interface component on a system level, or do I need to program it in my application and every application needs to reinvent it? Is it, is it you know, um, extensible that way? Does that require me hacking the source code of the Windows system, which we normally don't have access to, unless it's an open source system like X or, or, or Wayland? Um, or can it actually do that at runtime? Can I you know, add runtime, add new features to the Windows system so that all apps can make use of that? How well can I localize and customize at runtime, ideally? And is it possible to, um, for example, there's an interesting difference if you switched, at least, I don't know how it is with current Windows systems, um, if you switched a Windows computer to a different language, just to switch you know, the UI language off a different com from, let's say, German to English, uh, you'd normally have to kind of restart the machine and restart the whole system. Um, on the Mac, you could change it, and the next app that you start will just come up with that interface. Existing apps won't change, but every app that you start after that will use that new UI. So there's something about the dynamics, how fast the Windows system, uh, how agile it reacts to those changes. Um, how well are we doing resource sharing? So if we have uh, limited resources, for example, fonts, it doesn't make sense that every application keeps its own copy of, of, of every font because fonts are a read-only resource. You're 
never really changing them, right? Uh, so they should be shared among everybody um, so that you don't have um, unnecessary waste of, of memory and, and those kinds of resources. Less of an issue these days than it used to be. But again, once you get into uh, resource-controlled environments like mobile computing, wearable computing, um, you know, devices that need to be um, battery-powered, you very quickly get back to these um, essentials. Can I use the system over a network? Can I type over here, see the feedback from, an in, from a device over here, or from an application over here, but the application is actually running on your computer back there? Is that possible or not? We'll see some systems that can do that. Uh, most can't. How well is the API structured? How comfortable is it to program with it? Um, do I get um, all the widgets that I want? So as an app developer, you'll quickly take a look at the widget set, the, you know, the buttons, menus, scroll bars, those kinds of things that you have available and say, ah, yeah, I can work with this, or wow, I need to do a lot of stuff myself. When people got into building interfaces for 3D environments in VR, uh, this is currently a huge issue, because when you w write apps in virtual reality, you are basically creating your widgets uh, from scratch. You need to do it all yourself, right? It's like back in the 90s. Um, on a normal desktop, we have all this stuff available. And then it, it's nice if we have a certain independence of the application and the, and the interaction logic inside the program um, that, that are written for the Windows system, which means, let's say you write an application for Windows, you know, Microsoft Windows, you want your interface code to be nicely separable from your application logic, like what your, what your application is actually doing for, for money, right? Let's say it's a, I don't know, it's a student database. So you want the database code and all that stuff that's in the back end to be nicely packaged away, and you want the interaction with the user, the GUI, uh, the event handling, and all that kind of stuff to be separated so that if you need to move to a different platform, let's say you want to run on Linux, it's easy to exchange the UI versus while the backend can probably run almost unchanged. So this is, this is good if you can do that. Um, and then, of course, um, Windows systems do some other stuff that we take for granted, but we never think about how that really happens. For example, um, cut and paste. Ever thought about what actually needs to happen so that you can you know, mark some text in your browser, hit, a, hit you know, Command C or something, or Control C, move over to your mail client, and hit you know, control V and, and you get the text. Or you do that with an image, or maybe you even drag the image from your browser to your mail client. There's a lot of stuff happening there that passes data between applications uh, in readable formats that needs to be done by the Windows system. Now, Windows systems are a wonderful example for conflicting roles. Um, Let's start with uh, what you guys are probably most uh, familiar with, which is uh, you're an app developer. So you have a Windows system, I don't know, Android, for example. Uh, it gives you a user interface toolkit, and you write your apps for Android. You basically want, uh, as an app developer, an, an API that is simple but powerful. Right? You don't want to waste time reinventing the wheel. You want lots of ready-made classes and widgets that work well together. You can assemble your interface quickly, build your interface from basic building blocks, get it running, and, and focus on your, on your uh, application logic, on your business code, basically, that does something that's unique to your app. Because user interface code, let's be honest, is going to be quite repetitive, right? Most applications have similar user interfaces in terms of how they work. They've got buttons, and they've got you know, scroll bars if it's on a desktop and those kinds of things, and they always repeat themselves. So you don't want to waste a lot of time on that. So that's one point of view. The user, of course, doesn't care how much you sweat to write that app, right? They just want an app that's nice to use, that's easy to use. So the user is interested in an application that is immediately usable. I don't need to spend any learning and effort on it. But if I'm an expert, I want to be able to, you know, like change my keyboard shortcuts and do those kinds of things. And right, they don't care how hard it is for you to write that code. Um, and finally, the Windows system developer who wrote this Windows system in the first place, or the team that wrote it over years usually, um, they want a system that is manageable or can be you know, administered and extended and cared for over years. So it has to have an elegant design that can scale up over years of use that is hopefully portable to new hardware platforms as they come out, 
Um, so these goals are in part in conflict, right? To give you an example, um, when the Mac came out, the usability of the Mac user interface, we talked about this in DS1, was really nice, right? It was really easy to use, much easier than the, uh, the text interfaces before. And the Mac, of course, only had stolen that concept, no, adapted that context concept from, you know, the, the uh, Alto and Star from Xerox Park. So this whole idea of the, the, the GUI really made things easier for users, right? It gave them a much easier way to use computers. But programming those things was terrible, right? In the early days, Mac development would happen on what's called the Macintosh Programmer's Workbench, which was a text-based development environment where you had to, you know, build everything on, on text-based interfaces. The only thing that was a little, um, you know, light in the dark was this um, uh, ResEdit, the, the editor for making the icons, you know, uh, and, and the, in the graphical layout of your interface. You had a sort of a graphical editor for doing that. But that was all. Everything else was text-based. So tough for the app developer, really nice for the user. We won't be able to solve this problem with our reference model, but the reference model will show you if these conflicts exist, how they exist, and maybe give you ideas for how to address them or how to solve them one way or the other. And every real system will show you a trade-off point in this, in this space. Right? Some systems are really nice from a, from a design point of view, from a Windows system point of view, really elegant. Um, some are really nice to program with, some are not so nice to program with, and some are create a great user experience and some don't. So this model you will uh, see a lot over the next two weeks, uh, and we'll actually refer back to it when we talk about our existing systems. It's a layer model. It's a kind of, you know, maybe remind you of the ISO OSI uh, uh, model. It's some, in some way idealized. Real systems will often have a more a fuzzier look where things are being you know, merged together for performance reasons or for um, you know, protecting certain kinds of code and not revealing it. Um, sometimes we don't know how it works because we're not being told. Um, but this is a good model to understand the conceptual parts that need to be there some way, or one way or other. Every level, of course, shields the levels below, makes them go away. It's kind of like a virtual machine model, only gives you the abstraction and the defined uh, functionality on its level. Um, where do you think the operating system is here? Yeah? Is it base system? The base window system can be part of your OS, but it doesn't have to be. For example, this, this is very closely reflecting how X works, um, the X window system and Unix. And Unix is the complete operating system. Unix has no idea about graphic user interface. It's all text-based. And then X comes on top of that and runs all, everything graphical. Right? So in that case, where would you, where would you say it, it sits, the OS? Yeah? I mean, it has to be at least at the layer between hardware and base control system, because that's a software, uh, that's an operating system by definition. Yeah. At the very least, it goes in here, right? If you have a system like Unix that, as you know, comes from the the, the day of of, of main, mainframe computers, and has no inherent idea of um, graphical interfaces, it's all text-based, then it would sit here and. X, for example, in the 80s had to add all these layers on top of that, all the graphic user interface stuff, in, starting with the graphics library that has drawing commands in there for painting lines on the screen and handling events all the way up to the UI toolkit was all on top of that. So here you would typically see an OS sitting in, if it's a very clearly layered model. But modern systems often merge these lower levels together and you can't actually tease out one or exchange it or, or play with it or, or replace it. So that's a typical place. You know, you, you'll see that to this day, um, Darwin, the, the approach that uh, Linux takes, the approach that Mac OS X takes, although Mac OS is basically just another variant of Unix, um, they all have this uh, OS wedged in here, and this comes on top. Um, Windows, for example, doesn't give you that clear um, spread, but it's all integrated in the operating system up to the higher levels here. 
Um, another interesting question is where, where is the user in this? Yeah. And say evolve the apps because it's interacting with the application. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. so. You're right and wrong at the same time. So mentally, the user conceptually in your head, if you think about DIS1 models, like uh, the user is above the app. He's interacting with the app. As a user, I approach the system with an interaction goal. I want to, I don't know, write a letter or something, and I will interact with the app on that sort of cognitive level. But he's also somewhere else. Yeah? yeah. yeah. Is the hardware? Because uh, the user is interacting with the keyboard, for example, yeah. and the keyboard is uh, a piece of hardware. Right. So, in fact, if, again, if you go, that's correct. And if you go back to the ISO OSI you know, layer model, it's almost the same, right? On a very low level, on a physical level, my fingers are creating events um, you know, on the keyboard, are typing and using the mouse and stuff, and so I'm interacting with the hardware. Well, my brain is sort of, if you like, interacting with the app on a very high level abstract level. Right. So yes, uh, you'd place the user physically on the hardware side and abstractly uh, from a mental operation of sort of on the application side. What do those levels do? I maybe should you know, talk about this real briefly here, but we'll see much more of that in the coming days. Um, if I punch a key, it gets picked up by the hardware, the keyboard. There is a driver somewhere there. Um, it's part of the OS that takes that key event uh, and passes it on to what's called the graphics event library. That library takes all kinds of events, key, mouse, other stuff that might come in, and sorts it, formats it, then passes it on to what's called the base window system. The base window system knows which application has which region on the screen. So if I click the mouse at a particular location, it can figure out, oh, that was for your web browser because you just clicked in the rectangular area where your web browser window is. So it takes that event and passes it on uh, to the web browser. Meanwhile, the window manager, which often sits out to the side and is often just one application like the others, gives you, decorates the windows, draws buttons around them to close windows, stuff like this, to make them movable around the screen. So the applications don't need to worry about that. And the UI toolkit is that box of widgets, buttons, scroll bars, menu bars, dialog boxes, all those kinds of things, alerts, all these things sit in the UI toolkit and are the components that you as an app developer most directly work with. So your app usually has to use almost exclusively stuff from the UI toolkit, as it should be in a layer system, right? Occasionally you'll see systems that let, let, let the app reach down into these lower levels here, for example, to write your, your business logic, you know, the, the backend code that is not UI. In a way, you could say that the, uh, the graphics event library sort of is there to implement the graphics model, vector-based, drawing-based, pixel-based, uh, and process input from the user and draw things. The base window system is sort of your uh, abstraction from the physical world. It abstracts away from the physical limitations of one screen and gives every app its window to draw in, even though that window may not be on the screen because it's behind another window, but the app doesn't no or care. Um, the window manager implements the UI to windows, not the UI inside a window, you know, the, the, the boxes you have in your, in your dialogs, but the UI to the application, to the window as a whole, with the decoration around it, buttons for closing the window, for example, moving it around. And the UI toolkit is your API for the application developer that has, among other things, the construction set, so to say, to build apps with. There's, there are more things in each of these layers, but that's a very general um, model. Let's take a peek into the graphics event library before we wrap up for today. Uh, this is the lowest level that we have, and the GEL is essentially there to take data that comes from the device drivers on the input side, um, like a keyboard press, and turn it into canonical events that the Windows system then can handle whether it's a keyboard or a mouse or something else. 
So on the input side, it does processing of the events and can, uh, canonicalizing them. On the output side, it gets graphics commands from the higher levels uh, and turns these from typically logical coordinates into memory addresses. Where does this need to get painted in the window buffer, in the screen buffer, on the screen? And then sends that on to the operating system, the graphics hardware. You can see, so there's, and this is going to continue with the other layers. Uh, this is, there's an input and an output line here, basically, from the user, uh, user's input up into the system and from the system out onto uh, the screen, for, mostly. <coughs> the graphics event library also has a sublayering, oftentimes, not always, that basically takes the device-dependent code and the device-independent code and, and puts them on top of each other. So the device-dependent sublayer will optimize for your hardware, let's say, um, the resolution of your screen, the colors of your screen that you have supported, um, whereas the device-independent one hides that and creates sort of almost an, another sublayer inside the, the GEL that's another virtual machine to work on. So for example, when you're writing an app, you don't want to care about whether the user has you know, a screen that's 1024 by 768 or whether it's you know, uh, full HD or whether it's maybe even a, a black and white grayscale panel. Uh, you don't have to worry about that in your application, and you don't. Right? For these layers uh, solve that as a very, at a very basic level. Okay, so one of the things that the graphics event library needs to implement is the graphics and event, uh, the, the graphics model. And there we uh, distinguish two basic uh, ways of doing that, very nicely visualized here by Sebastian, thank you, um, called the uh, raster op and the vector model. Raster op, or, or if you want a, a, a pixel model, basically is the original model that was used in early systems. Why? Performance, right? You didn't have the compute power to work with vector data and rasterize it all the time yourself. You had to work with pixels. This was introduced in the Alto. Uh, in fact, you may remember bitmapped GUI screen, right? It was one of the innovations of the Alto from Xerox Park. And it's very well suited to bitmap displays, especially if you're black and white, as we were in the early days of these things, because a black and white screen is a wonderfully simple thing. It's basically just a linear video memory where every bit of every byte is one pixel on the screen. Right? You put your bytes behind each other, and it's row by row, it's your screen. Right? So you save your uh, screen memory as linear video memory in, in your main uh, memory area. Um, so what you can do with that is mean that you can in address individual pixels directly by knowing it's that bit on that byte in, in, in the video memory. What that means, however, is that you get an absolute integer coordinate system, right? If I have a 1024 by 768 screen, that's all I have. I have 1024 by 768 pixels, and each pixel is going to be one bit if it's just black and white. If you want to change screen resolution, we're talking about a different size of your video memory, and also, if you designed your interface to be on that screen, you now need to redesign it for that bigger screen because it doesn't just scale up. This was an issue with early graphics uh, software that really had to change every time you move to a different screen size to, to work pro correctly. But it's very fast. If you're a bit of a coder, you know that transferring blocks of bits, you know, bit, bit block transfer or bit blit, is a very fast um, thing that you can do on your CPU with support of some memory processing chips. Um, so getting pictures on the screen was super fast. Right? You just took a bunch of memory and just swapped it in there, and boom, your picture was, was on the screen. Even that was, was you know, the, the, the big breakthrough in, in, in enabled GUI, uh, GUIs. Um, but of course, it has its limitations. Um, when, you, when you do this, you are actually not able to use a normalized coordinate system. And that's what happened with the vector model. Here, your application is no longer saying, draw a line from pixel 50, 50 to you know, 68, 68, but it just says, I want them to go from some mathematical number to some other mathematical number. You may have a normalized coordinate system that's just one unit by one unit, but it's, it's a continuous value, and, you, and the system breaks that down into raster operations to pixelate it for you. What's the big advantage of having it um, as a vector model, being able to draw in, in a normalized coordinate system rather than the pixels? Yeah? 
scales to basically any resolution. Right, it scales to any resolution, even to print, right? I mean, some of the early systems that did that were like display PostScript, used PostScript to render on the screen, and that meant you could draw a picture on the screen, and then you could send that same code to the printer, and it would print it at, you know, 300, 600 DPI uh, at wonderfully high resolution. Yeah. I think it's also important for this content that you can design something for one system and use it for yeah. multiple. In the, the responsive design, which we know now from like, you know, being able to design for the web for different output devices, um, also needs scalable um, uh, graphics. Although with responsive design, you're often actually changing the interface even more fundamentally. You're not just scaling it down mathematically, you're semantically altering the layout to match the device. But you're right, it's one of the uh, key points of it. And so we never see jaggies, right? This is what we're trying to show here with this. You, know, you don't get that pixelation um, with that. And it took... Um, the main big players like Windows and Mac OS, a long time to get to a truly vectorized drawing system. Uh, it's been only a few system versions um, that you are able to actually have the whole user interface be vectorized and resolution independent. And it actually shows more recently when we got to these high resolution screens, the ones that Apple likes to call retina, you know, so the ones that have lots more pixels than you can actually see, but give you the super crisp uh, text on, on the screen. Whenever you have parts of the system that weren't able to scale up in this vector-based way, you would see it all of a sudden because they kind of look weird and blurry uh, on these high-res screens. The other great thing that you get uh, by using something dis like Display PostScript, of course, is that you can now start to do things like arbitrary clipping regions. So some of these systems that used it, um, their advertising was, you can create a window that has the shape of a skull because I can create a clipping path for your drawing that is not just rectangular, but any arbitrary shape. Because we're now dealing with vector formats and, and uh, Bezier curves and those kinds of things. Whereas, of course, pixels, uh, pixelated screens really like their squares right? because they are you know, well-defined areas in memory. All right, we're going to wrap up here. It's 11 o'clock. Um, thank you very much for being here. We're going to continue the discussion of graphics library stuff next week. Um, and remember to bring the Declaration of Compliance on Monday to the lab. Show up for the lab, um, and um, we'll have the reading assignment on the page later today for you guys to take a look at. And um, on Monday, that will be the first assignment. There will be groups of two that you guys need to team up for. You can discuss this now if you want as you're walking out or find yourselves in the next couple of days. Um, by you know, the end of the lab on Monday, we should have our, our two groups of two defined. Thanks very much. Hope to see you again next week. This content was provided by RWTH, Aachen University.